Hi, Priya. Thanks for joining me, friend. Well, thank you for having me. I have been uh, really excited for this conversation for many reasons, but one of them is, of course, that I've just been thrilled about what you all are doing at Fractal, both with sort of like living situation and the university and of course, recently have been taking class at Fractal University. And um, yeah, I guess I've admired your, admired your projects for from afar for a while. Um, it seems like y'all are doing some impressive stuff and I want to get to hearing about that. So uh, I'm glad to have a chance to dive into that. Um, but of course, I'll start you with the question I ask everyone, the fun one, the hard one, which is asking about your life story. And, you know, for me, um, Hmm. People are just, people are just so precious to me. Like I, part of me feels like if I could have these conversations with literally, literally everyone on the planet, I would love to do that because everyone has a story and everyone has qualities that I just see as incredible. And, um, when I have these conversations, it feels like a chance to really see someone and hear their story and see those qualities and bring them to light. And I really feel like for this, the time of these conversations, like the person that I'm speaking with is almost kind of a spiritual teacher to me. It's like they have qualities and and lessons for me to learn from and be inspired by. And um, I'm really in this like receptive mode where I'm just like, what 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 am I here to learn? And um, we'll see what ends up coming out. But um, there's no pressure. It's just like you being you okay. is all you need to do. <laughs> you already are you. You can't Let's fail. <laughs> yeah. But from that perspective and that's part of why i asked this question because i feel like people's stories really inform who they are and what qualities they bring to their life and of course if i'm interested in the project that they're working on it informs what project they're doing and why they chose that and all that so i just love to start at the beginning and be like tell me about your life yes. and what's happened for you so you can answer that in any way you want to i'd love to hear whatever you would like to share yeah, totally. Yes. Um, yeah, no, it's kind of crazy to tell your life story because you can just choose any any among probably infinite narratives. Um, but I'll tell you a life story that I think kind of like brings us all the way to Fractal. Um, so I grew up in Palo Alto, it, which is kind of, you know, it's like it's where Stanford is, it's where tech is. I was born in the early 90s. And so in some ways, it was like the center of the world. Um, and my friends' parents were all professors and working in tech. And my dad was a software engineer. Um, and so in many ways, you know, I, I, I was just a child. I didn't know what was happening, but I, I actually see myself as very lucky. Um, it's kind of like, I don't know, being born in like Athens and, you know, the peak ancient Greece or something like that. It's like I was just in the middle of it all, which was um, wonderful. Um, and and I don't know, I don't know, had a good childhood, whatever. But then I got to high school. And I went to a high school that uh, had something called a suicide train. So we basically had like a lot of suicides, like probably 12 or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and it was like national news. It was, you know, in all the major newspapers, all these things. Um, and it was this big crisis. And, and this phenomenon happens sometimes around the world. It's like one person commits suicide and then you have kind of like copycat suicides. People kind of see it as something that they can do too if they're feeling depressed. Um, and... Yeah, so that was quite a formative experience to be so young and to have so many of my peers commit suicide. Um, and people I knew, people I you know had classes with, all these things. Um, and so I think that, that led to a very early question in my life, which is like, how can I be among like the kind of most privileged people probably in history, uh, like wealthiest, you know, in, in that sense. Um, and yet people here are so unhappy. Um, and when I look back to, I don't think I, I had the self-awareness at the time, but I think I was also quite depressed, like through high school. So that was kind of like one kind of train of thought that continued through my life. Um, and then, then I went off to college um, and essentially I kind of rejected, I rejected like Palo Alto and almost like tech culture and striving culture. And I thought like, I just want a really simple life basically. Um, but I led kind of a, a simple, you know, not like a Simon Sarah's fancy life or anything, but just, you know, I had my job, I had my friends, I, you know, I, I, I lived like a normal life. Um, and I found that quite dissatisfying as well. Uh, and then I basically, when I was like 25, I uh, decided to switch careers and 
essentially become a software engineer and move back to SF. And I kind of like re-entered this whole world, but as an adult. Um, and I had a really different experience. Then. I had an experience where I was like, oh, actually, this is really exciting. And there's like all these people who are passionate about what they're doing. And there's like all these infinite opportunities. And uh, I felt like before when I had been in the non-tech adult world, all my friends were like depressed and underemployed. <laughs> and then suddenly I entered like this scene of people who uh, it just felt like we're not like that. Um, and I think my own sense of what I was able to do expanded a lot, like starting from that point. Um, and then also I think kind of Twitter plays a role in it. I got on Twitter and I found what is now known as Teapot and I made all these online friends who became my real friends. Um, and so, and so that's, I think another kind of question or thread in my life, which is like, looking back, it's like, I see myself as essentially low agency in my early twenties. And then I went through this period of transition where I became a lot higher agency and I also became a lot happier. And then eventually I was living in San Francisco. There's a very strong co-living scene there. Um, and Andrew and I, or I met Andrew, who's my husband. We wanted to live in a co-living house, um, but no co-living house wanted us. Um, mostly, I think, because we were a pretty new couple and it's a big risk to take a couple in a co-living house because they might break up and it might cause drama. And also just because in general, co-living houses, like there's just a lot of demand basically for them. So a lot of co-living houses, if you're trying to get a room, there's lots of people trying to get that room. So we were really impatient and we just decided we're gonna start our own. And we ran a co-living house called The Rabbit Hole. And we ran that for uh, about a year, but then COVID hit. And so basically um, after like our year long lease, we decided it's mid COVID and everything's really shut down. And so we all shut down in the house and kind of everybody ended up in different places. And then kind of late COVID, our co-founder of The Rabbit Hole, whose name is Eric, he uh, he just called us one day and he said, I'm I'm signing for a summer sublet in New York City. Uh, you guys should sign with me. And the New York City housing market is really crazy right now. And every summer sublet I've tried to sign has fallen through. So if you want to come move to New York City, you have to decide by tomorrow morning. Um, and then we said yes. And that is the building that uh, you've probably been to. That's a, uh, it's called McKibben, very famous artist lofts. And we uh, ended up moving there and eventually building out this. Uh, entire community that was mostly based there is now a little bit more spread out but um that that kind of brings us to now <laughs> thank you for sharing um let's see a few questions what do you feel like motivated you to go into tech and sort of exit this low agency phase of your life it was literally just, uh, I would go, you know, I would, I would go back home and visit the Bay Area, you know, a couple times a year. And I would hang out with high school friends um, who were in tech and, and they were like the only optimistic people that I knew, basically. Um, and I was living in LA at the time and I just felt like, I literally, like the main thing I noticed was, oh, there's actually like a bunch of happier people here that I hadn't really been able to find. And I, I I had lived in LA, but I also lived in Nashville for a while. So I lived in a couple cities. Um, and yeah, I just felt like there was like an energy in San Francisco and in tech that I, I didn't see anywhere else. And then my dad was a software engineer and he had been, you know, running this campaign. He's also Indian. And so kind of like Indian immigrant parent kind of thing where he, he was like, Priya, you should learn to code. Like you would love to code, you know? <laughs> so I think he was in my ear for a long time. I mostly was ignoring him. I didn't think he had wisdom there. Um, but eventually I, I took just like an online class and I had a lot of fun. And then I kind of ended up sticking with it a little bit longer and eventually decided to go all the way. Mm -hmm. And what was your like career arc with technology and coding like? What was that like for you? Yeah, I so I basically went to a coding boot camp. Um, I have a, a blog post about this, about how to think about deciding to go to a boot camp or learning on your own. Um, and I loved it. It was, I mean, the, the coding boot camp itself, I think, was this really transformational educational experience. Um, I'm also like very passionate about education, and I think it like opened my eyes to like how inefficient most of my education was. 
um, it kind of felt like summer camp. It's like three months of just like fully intense immersion. So you met six times a week. So that included Saturdays. And then class met from, I think it was 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. every single day. Saturdays were early days, which means we got off at 5 p.m. Uh, and so, and even sometimes you'd get off and you'd still kind of have work. So like you just were completely immersed and you were immersed with a, with a cohort of another like 25 people or so. And you ended up becoming like really, really close friends because you're spending so much time together, working together, but also being silly together. And and basically you come out of that with like the skill set to be able to essentially like get a six figure job. Um, and yeah, so I came out, I ended up, I worked at this uh, mortgage company um, because it's like, you know, your your baby in tech and you're just trying to take your first steps. And so I probably would have taken anything, um, but it was actually a pretty good experience. I was just like on their engineering team, building internal tools for a year. Um, but my my goal had been to move to working at a startup. So after a year, I ended up working for this startup called Air Garage. And I was literally their first engineer and their second hire. So it was like tiny, tiny team. It was five of us. And I really... Uh, liked and admired the founders um, and I still am on good terms with them and so yeah that was an amazing experience as well and then then basically COVID hit and I think that just like threw a wrench in everything and I didn't like working remotely and Andrew didn't like working remotely and so sometime midway through COVID we both just quit our jobs and didn't quite have a plan but we ended up starting like the SaaS startup that uh, was probably a little misguided and we ran it for a year and it it failed, we, we shut it down, but was also a really good learning experience for us. Um, and then simultaneous to that, uh, kind of like in those years, we were also building co-living. And so eventually we ended up going much more into this co-living arc, essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anything that you're doing with tech now? Uh, not really. Andrew is much more involved with tech than I am. So, mm -hmm. so fractal, we have fractal university and we have some coding classes at fractal university. Um, a couple of which Andrew teaches and, uh, Andrew, and then another close friend of ours, Jake, they're launching a boot camp, uh, very similar in style to the one that I went to. So it's like three months, really intense. Um, and basically taking people from like very beginner coding skills all the way to like, we will help you find a job. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see how to ask this question. One second. Um, it's interesting. I'm remembering when you were talking about high agency and this period of your life where you're becoming more high agency. You said that these people that you were connected to were uh, both higher agency and happier. And they're, you know, later on, you said that they're optimistic. And mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm wondering how you conceive of what high agency is and what it meant for you to become higher agency. And um, yeah, also how it relates to happiness. That's sort of like three different questions, but agency, yeah. go. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, great question. Um, uh, oh, goodness. It's like agency is your own, it's like your own confidence and your ability to get shit done. And also your own capacity to get shit done. Like you, you can't really be high agency if you like, I don't know, are overconfident, but then constantly failing or something. So it's like a combination of competence and confidence. And I think my my feeling before I kind of came back into this like tech world was like maybe the world has all these problems and like I want to kind of make a difference in some way, but I just felt like I had no path or no mentors or anything like that. Um and I just like I didn't have a good theory of change, like how I would make a difference. Um, and um, let's see, I, I, I have mostly lost my train of thought. What is agency? It's yeah. And I guess how it relates to happiness is, is essentially like, if you can, if you are confident in your ability to get things done, then like the next step is kind of like, I don't know, very, uh, teapot self-awareness-y things you basically decide like well what do I want to do and then you can just decide what you want to do and then you can do it and then you do it and then you're mostly happier usually mm -hmm. assuming you've gotten both of those steps right which is like you're truly introspecting and not like just following some you know status or whatever whatever it is like you're you're truly doing what you want and then you pursue it basically and if you look back on your younger self, who is sort of lower agency, and you look back on the time period where you sort of 
started to become more high agency, like how would you characterize the difference in yourself and what changed for you, like specifically? What was that like for you? Yeah, I guess one thing that comes to mind is um, I definitely resonate with that uh, famous Tyler Cohen quote where he says um, that thing about basically raising aspirations like the what is what is the quote? He says um, the high return activity of raising others aspirations, which is basically he's saying like you can tell a young person like, hey, I think you can do something like even grander and even bigger and I think you're capable and that is often enough to kind of like help unlock their talent. Um, and so for me, actually a big part of that story was joining Twitter and essentially I was never really an alt, but I wasn't really like, I didn't have my last name. I don't, I had a series of profile pictures, some of which were me and some of which were not. So it's like alt E and, um, and yeah, I was just kind of fooling around and, and just sharing my thoughts. But I think I started getting like, um, a lot of positive feedback from people and a lot of positive feedback from people I looked up to. And uh, I think it helped switch my self-conception where I, I really, literally think using Twitter made me realize that I'm smart in a way that I hadn't realized in childhood, in part because growing up in Palo Alto, you're surrounded by like lots of smart people and your kind of like gauge of like your own abilities, I think it gets really skewed, which is, I honestly think part of why all these people commit suicide. It's like all these very capable people who somehow think that they are incapable in some way. Um, I forgot your question, but that that is part of the arc. Yeah, just how, how would you describe it, yourself being different for making those shifts? <clears throat> so part of it is like seeing yourself as intelligent and- um... Yeah. Well, I think, I guess if I think about me now versus me many years ago, um, I think I think the like I'm much higher confidence now, but also I think it's like like to me, I think now it feels natural to be a leader. And I kind of see that myself that way. Um, whereas I think when I was younger, I don't know, I, I didn't feel that way or I felt like it would have felt like LARPing or something like that. Now it feels like, OK, I have useful things to teach. Yeah. Do you have a sense of whether being higher agency is related to being happier? Yeah, I think it really is. Yeah. I think like if you're lower agency, you can just feel stuck. You'll be unhappy with your, you know, parts of your life potentially. And then you just don't know how to fix them. Like for me, it's uh, rare for me to encounter a problem that I'm not able to fix mm. essentially. Mm. Like in some ways I feel like my life has no problems. Like I, you know, I run into problems, but then it's just kind of like, okay, we fix this, we fix this, we fix this, we fix this, and then it, on a bigger and bigger scale. Um, yeah. What would you tell your younger self about agency? Hmm. Oh, I think I would tell her that it was, it's fun. I think that's probably the, probably like biggest shift in my mindset is I think like growing up in Palo Alto, seeing all these kids suffering. Um, I think when I looked at people who were like doing big things in the world, I thought that they were stressed and unhappy and all of those things. Um, and I think what changed that belief was essentially moving to San Francisco, changing kind of who I was around and sometimes, you know, making friends or just spending time with people who were doing really big things in the world. And realizing that actually, like, they they were often quite happy, actually. Uh, when mm. I think from the outside, I felt like, oh, that's just a, it's a very stressful life or something like that. Um, but internally, I think it's often not a very stressful life in the same way. Mm. How do you approach solving problems now? I think the, the biggest way I approach it, I guess there's two things. Number one is I approach it like communally in the sense that like almost all of my, pro like I'm constantly in a conversation with uh, Andrew, with my friend Daniel and with like a bunch of our other friends. Uh, we go on a ton of walks and we just like, I just, I spend a lot of time talking to other people and I trust their advice. And so a lot of solving problems now is just like almost like talking about my problems 
um, even and oftentimes they're so small they're they're not even conceived of as problems yet. But it's like I am constantly talking to people and they're constantly like riffing with me where we like to use the word scheming. Um, but yeah, they're they're constantly kind of giving me feedback, asking me questions. And so I just feel like I'm socializing and hanging out, but actually through that process, I'm constantly solving my problems. Hmm. And then I think the second one is like urgency. Like I think sometimes when I was younger, I might have a problem and I might think like, okay, I'll solve this problem. And my, my solution would be intended to take like two months or something. Like it just felt like problems took a long time to solve. And now I have like, totally the opposite feeling like I'm just like oh okay how can I solve this problem like today basically and I often can and even even a really overwhelming problem I think can actually just be solved very quickly hmm. amazing <laughs> I love this yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to go back in time to um your co-living experience and it was the, the rabbit hole is what you called it, mm -hmm. Yeah. What would you say you learned from doing that project with Andrew for a year? Yeah, the biggest learning was at the time I was probably like, I wouldn't say I was more idealistic because I am still considered myself idealistic in certain ways. But I basically like stopped believing in democratic institutions. So we had a well, living house, it was five bedrooms. Uh, it was five to seven people, depending on who was there. And COVID hit and COVID kind of destroyed like a lot of co-living houses because people had very different views about, you know, how much to mask, how much to go out, uh, safety with like getting groceries, things like that. And essentially we had set up the house to be kind of like a democracy, so to speak, but actually there were only, only three of us, like Andrew and I, and then our third co-founder, Eric, had taken on the risk, like we had the lease. And also because it was COVID, a lot of people were like leaving the city and coming through. And so even in terms of choosing roommates, it was something we were all supposed to kind of communally choose. But then there were some people who I think were averse to new roommates because of COVID, because they were so worried about people coming through and we were figuring out our, you know, uh, what do they call it? Like quarantine, you know, set up. Um, but obviously some of us had like all this money on the line and like some of us had really unequal risk. And we also at some point had a roommate who I think I would just describe as a bad actor in some ways. Um, and I think we had just never dealt with that before. But she almost tried to use democracy like evilly or something like that. Like basically like I think the entire house was very frustrated with her behavior and wanted to kick her out. And she kind of knew that. And she almost like wanted to put it to a vote in a way. Um, and what's crazy is that every single person like wanted to vote her out. However, you basically are forcing like a um, uh, like like people, a lot of people aren't really comfortable like saying that sort of thing publicly. It's like a lot of people are conflict averse, basically. And so our other housemates would come to us and tell us like this person really needs to leave. But then they also didn't really want to be involved in the process of like asking her to leave, essentially. And so, yeah, I think and the, and the other thing we realized is that in in a situation like that, because when you're co-living, you're, you're bound to sometimes run into these major issues. I think it also is really intense to basically go to somebody and tell them, hey, like you're out because nobody here wants you here. <laughs> as opposed to go to them and be like, hey, like, unfortunately, like, this isn't working for me, you know, and, uh, and it's not about anyone else in the house. It's just like, this is not the right situation for me. And like, I'm the leaseholder, I'm the head of household, whatever it is, right. And so ever since that point, like fractal, we think of it as, um, we think of it as authoritarian, but there are many authoritarians. So I guess I'd have to kind of explain the premise of a fractal. Um, maybe I should pause and do that. Um, but but yes, basically, I, I believe in the concept of many authoritarians as opposed to democracy. That was the biggest change. Hmm. Do you see yourself as conflict averse at this point? No, no. And you can't be. I think uh, I think I, I tweeted this on my alt recently, which is basically like, I think probably one of the most important skills 
of uh, a community organizer is disagreeability and you have to you have to just face conflict head on. What did you used to be conflict averse? Yeah, yeah. There was a time definitely when I was younger when I when I was. Hmm. What help what practical things have helped you to become more disagreeable? It's a good question. So okay, I think I think meeting Andrew helped a lot. Andrew, I think, was like I think we've been, I think we were on kind of opposite arcs. We're really, really similar in some ways, but one of the biggest differences I think in our personality is he grew up as like kind of like the classic disagreeable nerd to the point where like he would get in these like big fights with his best friends. Um, and I grew up and and I think this is somewhat gendered too, but I grew up relatively agreeable to the point where like I think my conflicts with friends were actually that we weren't addressing. There were things that were going unaddressed and he had to learn to kind of like temper himself and I had to learn to become more disagreeable. And so, yeah, I think I just learned literally directly from like watching him and talking to him. And also even like sometimes I'd have to compose like an email or a text uh, where I would kind of like address something and I, and I would, you know, show him my draft. And oftentimes he'd be like, no, no, this is really bad. And then he'd, he would just like rewrite things for me for, for several years, I would say, actually. Do you remember some of the things that you specifically learned from watching him or him giving you feedback on your messages or things like that? Yeah, I think like, I think part of it is like if you're conflict diverse, you can get to the point where like you're you've been avoiding the conflict for too long and then you're like really emotional and then that can kind of come out in your language. So I think oftentimes his his edits were like they were firm, but they were almost like kinder. Like my messages were like not always very warm. And I think he kind of taught me how to send messages that were like warm and honest, but while like also being really direct and firm. Whereas I think I had trouble. It's like either I was like you know, not being direct or I was being direct, but in a way that was like a little bit too harsh and would make somebody feel bad and would kind of like um, escalate the conflict or something like that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm trying to just to like, I'm trying to imagine sometimes I learn a lot from like role playing a scenario. And I'm imagining, say, I was like your roommate and I was like playing music too loud or something like that. Like, how would you disagree with me and, you know, approach this uncomfortable conflict now if I was like, oh, I'm playing my music too loudly or something? Yeah, I mean, I think I probably would just tell you. Um, uh -huh. I don't know that we've ever had somebody who plays their music too loud, even though that does seem like a very normal thing. We did have somebody who who didn't stay for, with us for too long, but like would sometimes basically take Zoom calls in the living room with no headphones. So you can uh -huh. hear both him and his Zoom partner <laughs> and like loudly too. Uh -huh. And then, I mean, I think the way I handled it was like, I told him like, hey, you can't do this. Like you have to take calls in your room. Uh -huh. And then sometimes if he'd be like on the call in the living room, I would literally like shoo him. I'd be like, go. go, go you know? <laughs> <laughs> and mostly it worked. I mean, like, I think if you handle it right away, it's like, there's actually often no tension at all. You're just like, no, stop, no. you know? <laughs> and it's it's almost like silly. It's playful or something. And then obviously they keep doing it. Then you have to sit down with them. Um, actually, in, the, in that person's case, like that is somebody who we did basically not quite have to ask to leave because they were only on like a trial period, but we didn't continue after that trial period. Um, and so to some degree, it's like, okay, if, if you want to you want to set up some infrastructure such that like a person who is, harder to work with like basically just doesn't stay with you long term yes yes yeah. so fast forwarding again your friend eric calls you and says you need to decide by tomorrow morning that you're moving <laughs> to new york city or not what made you and andrew want to move to new york what made that a yes for you well it was only a summer sublet so it was like two oh, months, yeah. basically uh -huh. um so i don't like i'd never thought about living in new york before um, I had barely thought about New York. I'd only visited once for like three days. I think we had been living in SF and, you know, during COVID, it like super shut down and it was like just really, really boring. Then we kind of didn't have a home for a little while. But at the time Eric called us, we were literally living in Phoenix, which is where Andrew's from. And so we were hanging out with his family and high school friends. Um, and, you know, it was kind of nice, but I had been in Phoenix, you know, we'd only been there a month or two, but it was like long enough for me to know like, okay, I don't want to live in Phoenix. It's, uh, will be hard to find my people here and I don't love the desert and it's just not for me. It's very car centric. So I think we were, we were pretty open to anything at that point. We had no plans. So it was just easy to say yes. 
And it seemed like at this at a later point, there's maybe a point where you two were like kind of all in on New York. You're like, yes. Uh, what what made you fall in love with New York and sort of commit to it? Yeah, honestly, like I think in many ways we fell in like a weekend. Like we basically just like landed in New York. It was the summer post COVID, and it was like just so wild so basically a ton of our friends from the area were visiting New York that summer as well and then it was like enough to bootstrap a social scene and to meet a bunch of other people who just were already living in New York or had come to New York from elsewhere and so probably that was like it, I just landed in such a dense fun super active social scene probably more so than even what we'd had in San Francisco that there was no I think often when you move somewhere there's like a lot of kind of friction and you have to make new friends and all these things there was just literally no friction like it was just like it was just like constant fun from the moment we arrived and and then New York is like it's so fast-paced and I think if you had asked like a younger me if that's what I wanted I probably would have said no um like I didn't really envision myself in city life but it turns out it's really fun it's like it's just like you 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 have the opposite problem where you have to make sure like you take time for yourself and you do relaxing things and all these things. But like I imagine it as like this really, really fast river. And at any time you can step into this like super fast river. And as long as you remember that you can also step out, then it's like it's perfect. Um, mm. Also, we were both urbanism nerds. And um, and that was through our time in San Francisco. I used to own an electric scooter and Andrew worked for cul-de-sac, which is building car free cities. And so I think just like being here and taking the subway everywhere and walking everywhere was really fun for us as well. Mm. And one of the first things you all did like pre early on was starting your Sunday dinners. Is that right? Mm -hmm. How did that come about and what was that like for you? Yeah. Yeah, it's so funny because like now we look back and you know we say like everyone should do these Sunday dinners like this is how you build community but most of these things are are, are accidents and so Andrew and I were running this um, startup and we were working really hard at the time and New York was super super social and also people like especially during summertime but basically like all other than New York winter like all the rest of the year people were constantly visiting like friends of ours or, you know, Twitter people, and they would reach out and they'd be like, let's get coffee, let's do this, let's do that. And so essentially we were like socially overwhelmed. We were like, we don't have time to hang out with all these people. We have so much work to do. And we came up with this brilliant idea, which is like, anytime somebody reached out to us and said, you wanna hang out? We would just be like, oh, you know what? I can't on Tuesday, but actually I'm having some friends over for dinner on Sunday. And we would just redirect all of that energy into one day. And then it turned out that actually all of our friends were happier that way, especially people who visited. I think often, you know, it's like if you land in a new, new city and you don't really know that many people there, you can feel like a little bit bored, a little bit lost. I think a number of those people were considering moving to New York. And so basically like dropping into a dinner party where they met a lot of people who did live here was uh, a lot of fun for them. And actually some of those people ended up moving to New York. So yeah, it was really just an accident in order to optimize our time <laughs> hmm. yeah and how did it come about that uh people started living near you and what's now fractal how did that come about yeah it was a combination of things it was like we actually we didn't want to do co-living mostly you know we were running the startup we were busy and also you know, our co-living house was mostly through COVID and we had all this conflict in COVID. And so we we're kind of burnt out on co-living. And we thought like, okay, we're we're just gonna live a normal life. Um, but I feel like it's like this old habits die hard thing where at the very least we thought we should name our apartment. And so we named our apartment Fractal. And then when we started hosting dinners, we just gave them the name Fractal Sunday Dinner. Mm. And, um, and I think there's just a lot of power to a name. So like it became like instead of just like I'm going to Priya and Andrew's house, it became like fractal. Mm. Um, but really, I mean, we, it was a three bedroom apartment. So we had two roommates who were who were good friends of ours. But but it was just an apartment, basically. And then. Essentially, so many of our friends were moving from the Bay and we had a friend who w wanted to move. And then the apartment across the hall opened up. And so we basically helped her get that apartment. Um, and what's crazy is that that didn't actually quite end up working out. She signed the lease with us, but she ended up moving back to the Bay. But that meant that Andrew and I basically now were kind of like uh, caring for two apartments right across the hall from each other. 
one was a three bedroom, one was a four bedroom. And so, and you know, there was so much high demand in New York and so many friends coming through that we were just like, don't worry about it. Like you can move back and we'll, we'll fill these rooms. And suddenly that's basically the size of our co-living houses in San Francisco. We had seven, seven bedrooms, um, but Andrew and I shared a room and occasionally we'd have another couple. So it'd be like seven to nine people. And it was just like friends, the TV show. Like we just always left our doors unlocked. We would just pop into each other's places. And yeah, it was kind of like, oh, this is really fun and really powerful and really easy. And also like it's New York. So everybody is living in an apartment somewhere anyway. And so like, why don't they just live in our apartment building? And literally like for a lot of people based on where they were and where we were, like their rent would go down. Um, but if it wouldn't, it just like, it was the same amount of money. It was like so much less risk basically. It was just this coordination problem of getting people into our building. So then we had another friend who signed a unit and moved in. But then simultaneous to that, our friend Jason Ben had basically launched the neighborhood in SF. And the goal of that was like getting a bunch of friends within a five minute walk. And that was also taking off. And we kind of, at, we, we were shutting down the, the startup at the time and basically having some conversations with him where at some point we were like, you know what, this is like, this is it. This is like, we want to do this here in New York too. Um, clearly everyone's really happy living this way. We think we'd be happier, you know, with even more friends right here. And so then at some point we kind of developed more of like this vision and we just put it out into the world. I remember reading in your article about it, that there was this really charming aside where you're like, oh, I became friends with like the building manager or whatever. Uh, uh, yeah. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, our building manager is like super beloved. Um, mm -hmm. I, I bet you probably most people in our building consider him a friend, mm -hmm. which is to speak to like how charming and lovely he is. Mm -hmm. um, he's been working for our building for like at least a decade. And um, they actually, the building management tried to fire him at some point for silly reasons. And the there was like this huge kind of like, not quite a protest, but like a campaign essentially to be like, no, you can't fire him. And it was written, I think it was written up in the New York Times. It was like this big deal, basically. So he's this beloved super. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I have too much to say there. He's just, you know, he's he's just a good guy and mm. he got to know us and uh, kind of, you know, liked us. And so he would like, oftentimes, you know, the somebody would be moving out of a unit and they would leave a bunch of furniture behind. And so he would like call me and he'd be like, Priya, like, there's a bunch of free furniture here and he would kind of like let us have first dibs of furniture because we often have these new units we were trying to furnish and stuff like that um and that was great i mean and i think it encouraged us when we first landed in that building we landed there kind of randomly just because of our friend eric um but i think it was a big reason we ended up staying and building a whole community in that building was because even though upper level management is kind of standoffish and also tried to fire this building super and stuff like the the main person you interact with in the building was somebody just like so likable so helpful if things broke you know he'd always come and go above and beyond and on all that stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you were talking earlier about this like shift from sort of a, more of a democratic mindset to like many authoritarians uh what, what does that mean in the context of the fractal living situation yeah. So so basically the way Fractal works is so for those first two apartments, Andrew and I were kind of managing them. Um, but every other apartment in Fractal has been somebody else basically signs the lease and then it's it's totally their apartment. But it's often a three bedroom apartment, sometimes a four bedroom apartment. And they might sign alone or they might sign with a friend, but usually they have at least one extra room that they're just going to be subletting out, sometimes two. And they, yeah, they, they just do whatever they want with it. It's their, it's their home. It's their space. They furnish it how they want. They invite who they want. And similarly, we have a third space now, but the third space is basically like the super giant apartment. And the people who run the third space are the people who like sign this lease on the super giant apartment. And they have their own, you know, name and they have their own policies and, so yeah, basically the way it works is like in many ways we share space, like people will often pop into each other's apartments. Um, the third space is like much more explicitly like you're welcome to come co-work here, but whoever whoever basically like owns the space, owns the space and there's no 
um, there's no like universal rules. There's no meetings at Fractal. Um, it's just total chaos. <laughs> the the only sense of hierarchy, which I don't think is even real, but like basically Andrew and I are administrators of a discord. Mm. Um, although there are other people who have special powers in that discord depending. So for example, the people who run the third space have like all these kind of special powers to give roles and stuff like that. Mm. Um, but otherwise there's no, um, yeah, there's no, there's no voting. There's, there's no business. There's no, like, it's just like a shelling point and you just, you own what you own basically. Right. Huh. Um, at a certain point you've gotten big enough that there's two spaces. Yes. Like another neighborhood somewhere else. That's right. How did that come about? It actually came about when I got pregnant. So mm -hmm. essentially the original dream, like two years ago, part of why Andrew and I went ahead and wanted to go all in on this and build this is we, we knew we were going to be trying to have a kid soon, but we didn't really know what that timeline would look like. So originally when we kind of planted the flag in East Williamsburg at this building, we thought like, okay, this is the flag and we're going to build like a 1000 person kind of community in this general area. But none of our parent friends wanted to move there um, when push comes to shove. And you kind of like, you can get feedback from people before the fact, but you also kind of have to see like how it plays out. And yeah, basically like in New York City, there's a, uh, like different neighborhoods are meant for different life stages. And so that neighborhood is mostly like really young people. It's like a very particular culture. And it's really fun when you're young. It's relatively affordable for New York standards, like all of these things. But then parents often are just like looking for other things. And same thing, basically, as soon as I got pregnant, I was like, okay, actually, I don't think I want to raise my daughter here. I think I want to move to somewhere that is like closer to a park, closer to grocery stores, has like a lot more kids and pregnant women around. Um, and where the venues, like even the coffee shops, like everywhere you go, there's kids around and they're used to kids and it's normal. So yeah, basically we decided we would move and we would seed the next fractal. And also I think we're still early on where we're in some sort of experimental stage. So it has been really interesting to seed this one and see like how it looks different and, and what problems we're experiencing here versus there and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. hmm. Remember, we've talked about this a little bit, but when you published your article, there was, I, I read and I was like, this is great. Uh, a good how-to article, how to live with your friends. Uh, and then there was a fair bit of like negative reception as well. Do you have any sense of why people were bothered by that article or what was, I don't know, like sort of triggering to the collective consciousness about that, if, if yeah. you want to frame it that way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm not sure about this. I, but I, I feel like I don't have a have a great answer here. But I, right now, my answer is something like, literally, just anti nerd sentiment, essentially. Mm. <laughs> like, like the main criticisms we really got, because a lot of it was kind of getting canceled on Twitter. But like, if you really look at the things people were saying, it was like they were screenshotting some of the quotes we had in that post, and kind of being like, look at these nerds, essentially. Mm. And I think. The neighborhood we're in, um, you know, for the past like decade or something is known as like a very artistic neighborhood. And I think that Andrew and I being like these software engineers from San Francisco who kind of spoke in this way that maybe felt foreign to some people. Um, it just. Yeah, it was it was just it was just mostly a hatred of nerd nerd, nerd culture, I think. Hmm. 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 Yeah, I feel sad that the, that was, it was, it was, I was like, well, at first it was confusing to see that, but it was also sad. I was like, this is a good, this is a good thing. So. Yeah. Right. And it well, what's fascinating is like, yeah, there was just so much hatred, which is what makes it a little bit harder to make sense of. And what's interesting is that a lot of the hatred came from people who were doing something really similar to what we were doing. So um, there were a lot of jokes made. So the, the original post that I wrote didn't make it clear exactly where we were. And so people didn't realize that what building we were in. And we were in like this very historic building that has housed a lot of communities before us. And people made all these jokes like, well, haven't they heard of the McKibben lofts? Like, you know, mm -hmm. you know, like basically like it, it's kind of this like, oh, like, you know, uh, tech bro, like you you invented community, you know. Mm -hmm. And so they're kind of saying like, oh, well, we already have been doing community for a long time, um, which is totally true. And I think it's like we were not trying to say that we were doing anything novel. Um, 
my post was like for people who just wanted to build more community in their life and here is how to do it. Um, but then I think because then a journalist wrote about us and then actually several journalists wrote about us, it becomes this thing where it feels like you're making this like statement and people just like push back and they're like, you're not new, you're not cool, you know? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, community may not be new, but I think it's cool. So <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um where do you see the community, the living side of Fractal going in the future? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, yeah, the most, the thing we're most excited to experiment with is like making this more child-friendly neighborhood because right now Fractal 1 does not have any kids living there. Um, Fractal 2 has like four kids, I want to say, three kids, three kids, but soon to be four once, once my daughter's born. Um, but Fractal 2 is also like a really different model. It's not like we're all in the same apartment complex. We're spread out. The goal was to have people within a five minute walk, but like based on the housing market, really people are within like a 10 minute walk. And then there's a lot of people who I think feel connected to Fractal 2 who are within like a 10 or 20 minute subway ride. Um, so, so it's just a different kind of like a uh, way to coordinate like fractal one is like the coordination is like a, almost like a completely solved problem because everyone is in the same building and also because we have a third space there where you can just drop in any time so like the amount of like the density of fractal one is insane and like kind of the spontaneity and magic that comes out of that is insane and fractal two is just going to look different than that so yeah i mean like for me, I'm thinking about like, how am I gonna raise my kids? And like, uh, how am I gonna school my kids? And I think Fractal will kind of intersect with all of that because I think that's like a natural continuation. It's like, okay, what does what does community look like for my kids? Um, will we be doing like, have will we have like a micro school or Montessori school or something like that? Um, or maybe we won't, but maybe, but maybe it's just a coordination where people will be sending their kids to the same school or the kids and parents will be hanging out a lot and like, have their own kind of dense community um and then of course there's like the buying part so right now we're all renting and we have some people kind of like in our scene who are looking to buy like they've been they've saved their money a lot of them are people who you know grew up in the area and they're they're definitely committed to to staying um but for the most part we haven't really started anything like that and so I think a co-buying project of some sort is probably in our future. Uh, and I think it could, I think there will probably be things bought in New York City, but I also think we have been thinking about kind of expanding upstate and having, so what's really good is like, you know, New York has insane transit and that also extends to our trains. So like oftentimes if I'm taking just like a little weekend trip, I basically am taking the train upstate or up to the Hudson Valley and uh i basically don't use a car at all maybe i maybe i just take like a short 10 minute uber or something but um but yeah we we kind of want this connection between a place that's more rural that's somewhere along the train line where we have a lot more land um to like kind of a city hub mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. beautiful beautiful i love i love uh the hudson valley a lot so mm -hmm. yeah um and how did the university side of the project come about yeah, that's okay. It's a better question for Andrew because it really like lived in him. I think he kind mm -hmm. of like pitched me on it for a while. Like we should do this thing. And I was like, yeah, sounds cool. Um, but, but it, it was, he really owned it, I think. Um, and I guess, I guess part of the story is that we were all, you know, living together in Bracket One in this apartment building and somebody who actually was it was this couple who was who was just with us for the summer visiting from berlin um they wanted to take um i think they wanted to take andre carpathy's zero to hero class or something like that i, I didn't take this class but it, it, i think it's, i believe it's like an ml ai class or something and so they just kind of posted and they said does anyone want to take this online course with us uh we can just meet once a week and uh we can kind of like watch the lectures online we can do the homework we can et cetera. Um, and, and so, yeah, there was basically a small group of people at Fractal who were doing that and that included Andrew. And I think Andrew, like kind of being in this little class felt like, oh, wow, this is like super fun. And I've been wanting to learn this for so long. And finally I am, and I'm doing it with friends and it's so easy and it's so natural. And so that kind of planted the seed of like, what if we just start doing a lot more classes? 
And actually the original idea behind Fractal University was just that we would only teach online classes, like free open source online classes from the best teachers around the world. And that instead of having teachers, we would have TAs. So like I would volunteer to TA for, you know, a creative writing class, but actually what I'd be doing is I'd be streaming the class with the students and then I'd just kind of be facilitating. Um, but then we went to launch first semester and first semester was really small, it was four classes. But basically Andrew taught a class that was, um, basically based on, it wasn't actually based on online course, but it was based on a textbook. So the curriculum was handled. It was like, he was just deciding like how to kind of present the curriculum. Then uh, I think our friend Chris was also doing a class that was basically like an online class. But then me and Tyler kind of like took this container and were like, hmm, like I wonder what we could do. And we basically designed our own classes from scratch. Um, just organically, like I don't, I don't remember like ever consciously making that decision. I remember Andrew being like, "You should teach a class," and me being like, "Hmm, like I wonder what I should teach." And then I don't know what something shifted, like something happened, and I was like, "You know, I've been we've been building Fractal. I get all these questions about it. I should basically teach people uh, how to build something like this." And so I I created this class called "How to Live Near Your Friends," hmm. and um, Tyler created this class called "Body Mind World." Um, along with Alicia and they, they co-taught this class and basically they brought in all these guest teachers in like tango and buteau and, and all these kind of embodied practices and then after we, the guest teacher would teach their practice then Tyler and Alicia would lead this kind of discussion about like what what we learned from it and what it was like um, anyway basically those classes went really well and a bunch of our students wanted to teach the next semester and so the model just totally shifted where like I, we might have a handful of online classes, but they're very much in the minority. Instead, the classes are almost all custom designed, basically. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the different roles that um, it seems like uh, from the outside, it looks like there's four or five, six core players that are involved in like the community and the university and now the boot camp. Like, how would you describe the different roles that people play? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, all of Fractal operates as what we call chaos mode. Mm -hmm. um, we had no, like there was no nonprofit or for-profit entity. There was like, there was nothing official nothing like registered with the government or anything. There was really no money collected for a long time. Um, we just we just kind of launched our first like business, incorporated business, and that's called Fractal Bootcamp. That's the coding bootcamp. So in some ways that makes it much easier. I mean, people are, are mostly doing this for fun and like the gains that they're getting is social. And so that means, you know, there's not like job descriptions or anything like that. Um, yeah, I mean, people's roles very much depend on the person. So, like, I ended up handling, like, a lot of the housing, basically. Like, pulling people in, helping them find units and sign leases and furnish their apartments and find subletters. Um, Andrew, uh, probably, like, he has done a lot of uh, little kind of tech projects. So, for example, now we have this whole, like, whole subletter system that, like, kind of automates a lot of it. Um, and that's something he did with our friend Liam. Um, but then also Fractal University, that's something he very much owned and kind of like launched the world. Um, and then Tyler became like a really big kind of participant in that. And then, I mean, a lot of it has to do with different people's uh, skill sets too. So for example, I think Tyler is like our best marketer. And so that's a big reason I think uh, Fractal University has gone boom is because he's really good at just like telling the world about it. And um, and also literally doing things like like the first semester, we mostly advertised it on Twitter. In the second semester, Tyler did most of the advertising and he put it in like all these different newsletters and Facebook groups and just kind of blasted it everywhere. Um, yeah, it's 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 just dependent on, I think, what gives people energy, what they're naturally good at, um, what they're what they're driven to do. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. When you're married to Andrew, how would you say you two complement each other? Um, I would say so, Andrew, I, it, we're both chaotic in certain ways. But Andrew, I would say, will start literally infinite projects. Hmm. Um, like every day, there's like some new project starting. And he's always trying to rope me into these things. And he's like, you should do this with me. And in fact, so with Broccoli University, you know, he was like, I have this idea, let's do it. And I, I kind of kept saying like, 
like you do it, but I'm not going to do it with you because we were already like I was at capacity basically, uh -huh. right? In part because at the time housing was it, it was kind of time intensive, um, helping people with some of the housing stuff. But but also yeah, for me, I'm kind of like I will choose the the few things that I most care about, but I won't drop any balls. Hmm. Whereas Andrew like doesn't even know where the balls are. They're kind of like oh, you can imagine them juggling, and they're like here, 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 here. Um, uh -huh. And so, but part of why it works is that like. For a lot of things, I'm I'm kind of in some ways there to catch the balls, and that kind of like allows us to constantly be experimenting. And then the ones, the things that really work and matter, um, I think I can just be like a little bit more consistent towards sometimes. Hmm. So that's probably like the the biggest difference in our styles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. How would you say that you know we've kind of gone through multiple chapters of these different projects? Like, how do you see yourself having grown as a leader and you know, person who's participating in these projects over this time? Yeah, I definitely have grown a lot. I mean, I think we wouldn't be able to, to like, we wouldn't be able to be doing what we were doing like two or three years ago. Um, but how have I grown? I'm not totally sure. I think like I think maybe it's easier for me to answer the question of like what are Andrew and I together capable of now. Mm. Um and I think together I think the the biggest way we've grown is like there's a way in which we're really good at almost like I guess this kind of high return high return activity of raising other aspirations like basically like what often happens is people kind of come into this fractal ecosystem and then their agency like goes boom like this. And then suddenly they're like taking all these risks and they're quitting their jobs and they're, you know, launch launching classes. Um, and maybe they're, they're kind of like taking romantic risks and all of these things. And so, yeah, I think like there's something where we are better at coordinating with people and encouraging people and so that just like unlocks all this energy basically. And so there's constantly all this energy that like, we're kind of like, I don't know, like pushes us forward. It, and just like creates extra chaos or something. Um, and it's like, I think we were okay at that a couple of years ago, but now it feels like the kind of like the thing, like like our most unique skill set or something is like, we can do that and we can do it very quickly. And so it just feels like the community is like growing so fast, not just because of us, but but there's a lot of people working in this community. Um, but I do think that there's something, it's like we we developed some skills to help enable that, both by creating a, a culture at Fractal that does that, but also like through individual conversations. Um, and then And then there's just like so much momentum in that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you wish you had known when you started the housing or or the university or any of this? Oh no, is there anything I wish I had known? Um I mean, maybe just I think like there was a lot of trust put in the process and like, I think we're at the point where it feels like, okay, the, like, the trust has paid off. Like, actually, I think in many ways it was a big risk. I mean, basically, after shutting out that SaaS business, we we just went on sabbatical. We lived off our savings. Um, we, like, just lived quite frugally. And we did this thing that was at first very illegible. Um, and now it feels like we have all these, like, teammates and we have all these people trying to help us we have people who want to fund us like all these things um and yeah it just feels distinctly like we're kind of on the right path both for us but also for like our own sense of like almost like security as a family or something it's like okay cool we're we're like we're we're past like the hardest part i think in some ways um and so it's like i i do think i had some level of faith back then but um maybe I, yeah, just like doubling down on that, which is like, actually, if you trust the process, like it'll, it'll kind of work, you know? <laughs> mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. And how would you describe that process? Like, what is it that you are trusting? 
yeah what is that I was trusting it like like I was trusting that if we just fucked around and found out it would it would kind of work out I mean looking back I'm much um like looking back I think the way I conceive of the process is like it's almost like we went to grad school and we went to grad school in a way that like looks very strange from the outside to a lot of people <laughs> but basically it's like we weren't you know paying like sky high tuition out of school and we weren't learning in like these more traditional ways um instead we were learning by just like trying a bunch of things and doing things in public <laughs> and so the process is basically i think the process is almost like related to to like like you learn by doing maybe that's kind of the process the process is you will learn by doing and so if you just like take some time where you're you know not working a traditional job and you're like able to live off savings and and not focus on the kind of financial equation of your life like you will end up becoming highly skilled at something um which i i, I do think sometimes people take sabbaticals and it doesn't end up happening which i think often means that they kind of fell into a depression or like couldn't like weren't in the right community and didn't know how to create the community and stuff like that mm -hmm. um but but i think I think for a lot of people that process does work is basically like you give yourself all this space and time and you just follow your own interests and like you have no idea if those interests will be like useful or profitable or anything like that mm -hmm. but you are learning something that um almost by definition you'll have some sort of a monopoly on because you're not following a curriculum you're not like learning like a you know from like a historical kind of learning column or something hmm. um did i freeze i froze on my end yes okay anyway well hopefully i'll unfreeze soon let's see i'm really frozen though i might have to do something with my camera setup there we go oh here we go okay perfect <laughs> cool um i lost my train of thought but that's that, i think that's 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 most of what i wanted to say learning by theory yeah. do you have a sense of what your current growth edges are Hmm. I feel like I do. My my mind is registering a blank right now, but I feel like I'll I'll think about it. I'll think of it later today or something. I feel like I feel like even if I go through my notes app, I probably have some notes that are hmm. very relevant to this. Uh -huh. Um I mean, I guess if I if I just think through, like, like basically, I'm about to be, become a parent, so like that's the main thing on my mind, and that I think will change what my life looks like a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's like a lot of unknowns there. Um, but yeah, in terms of growth edges, no, nothing is immediately coming to mind. Mm -hmm. I, I'm remembering this Tyler Cowen quote that you mentioned earlier, and. I wonder, you know, you've done a lot of like raising of your own ambitions and raising of other people's ambitions. And I wonder, like, do you have any sense of what might be possible in the future for Fractal and, you know, the housing and the university and the boot camp? Like, are there things that you all hope you might be able to do in the future, you know, one, three, five, ten years from now, if you keep going in this direction? Yeah, there's many. Um, okay, and I think this relates to your last question as well. So I think, <laughs> I'm not quite sure this is a growth edge, but I guess one thing that I'm really focused on now is like um, being able to kind of like spread what we've learned like on a on a much bigger scale. And so, for example, like like when, it, when I look back the last couple of years, I really think like the most impactful thing I did was write that post called How to Live Near Your Friends, um, which went super viral and continues to go viral. Like people kind of like it continually and all of that. Um, and and I've had people reach out and I've had people who like take action based on it. You know, they're like, I started this like building group and I did this and I did that. And now I'm making friends and all of these things. Um, and what's crazy is like that was all, you know, it was obviously I, I took me a long time to learn it. I learned it through creating Fractal. But in terms of like writing it, it was just like kind of on a whim I wrote it like in an afternoon I published it like it wasn't you know uh that time intensive but I think it was probably like the highest impact thing I've done um and so one thing I'm working on right now is I am uh writing a book and I'm working with this very very cool independent publisher called Altamira Studio mm -hmm. um and I'm basically the plan is to publish it this year 
And so, so yeah, I think like part of the reason that we didn't take funding for Fractal and didn't make it an official entity for so long is that it's almost like we were trying to figure out the model for, like, I'd feel like basically, you know, especially during COVID, maybe a little bit before COVID, there was this moment on Twitter, but also just like in conversations in real life where everybody was really interested in this question. Like they wanted to like go live on a, you know, homestead and rural land with their friends. And it felt like this like impossible dream that everyone would kind of like almost like push back at and kind of make fun of like, oh yeah, everybody wants that, but that's impossible, you know? And, um, and so we were trying to uh, figure out how to make it possible. And I think we have like this model that works and I would like to kind of like communicate all the things that we have learned um, in a way that like people can read it all over the world basically and implement it themselves. So that's one piece of it. And then in terms of like what Fractal itself can become, um, I mean, I think you also had Daniel on your podcast, who's like one of our best friends. He he lives at Fractal as well, um, who runs something called Maximum New York. And so uh, there's some kind of like, like Fractal itself is not particularly pol political, but we definitely like a lot of people go through Maximum New York and we coordinate all together a lot. And so I think there's some sense of like, what can we do when we have like a kind of like high trust, uh, high density community uh, who wants to make the city better and who, especially as we start to like, you know, as people start to co-buy places, people who are kind of committing to the city long term, um, how can we kind of improve the city? So that's that's part of it. Um, potentially creating schools is part of it. Um, and I think also just continuing, I guess another way I think about this is when I when I look at San Francisco, I think there's like this super high density like community that's very very large uh and some of that comes from tech but actually a lot of it comes from like there were all these different seeds planted like there was like this big co-living movement that came from the hippies and and essentially like if you look at kind of this like social map of sf there's like all of these things that ha happened decades ago that like kind of led to this sf culture um and I see us as like kind of seeding, you know, there's some co-living here, but it's much, much less than an SF. And I am trying to basically seed both fractal, but also I, when I teach this class, how to live near your friends, I basically teach other people in New York how to start their own co-living houses all over the, New York. Um, and I think if we just like continue, like fractal two years ago was so much smaller than it is now. Now it's like, uh, in terms of people who actually live, like at Fractal One, it's maybe like 35 people or something. Um, so it's not that big, but in terms of like kind of the social scene that is like orbits around Fractal and takes classes at Fractal University and comes to events and like has made friends or gotten into relationships through Fractal, it's like hundreds and hundreds of people. And I think that can just like grow and grow. And so I don't exactly know what that looks like, but it's like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think it could lead to all sorts of interesting places. Mm -hmm. hmm. You're wanting to spread this model. How would you describe the model of how to live near your friends in sort of like broad strokes? Yeah, I think it's like, like, I think a lot of people felt really like, I think a lot of people thought it was like this financial problem. Hmm. And I think for a while, people who were kind of trying to take this problem seriously would literally decide on this life path where they said, like, OK, I'm going to go, like, make a lot of money, basically. And then once I make a lot of money, then I can buy this rural land and then I can bring my friends. And I just think it is not it doesn't have to be a money problem. I think what's really cool about kind of like creating community in an urban area is that, like, you basically, you know, everyone can sign for their own apartment and they can just get the same kind of like size and the same price of apartment that they would have gotten, you know, wherever they lived in the city. And the main thing is you're just coordinating people. Um, and the coordination, it's like, it's a little bit trickier than, than people think, you know, it's like, um, it can be kind of hard to convince your friends to live near you, but it's not that tricky. There's actually like a pretty easy process now that I, that I teach. And like, uh, you know, the first step of my process, you know, which I talk about in this blog post is literally just hosting weekly so that 
people come to visit your neighborhood every week and they start to get familiar with your neighborhood. Um, but also they start to get familiar with uh, all your disparate friends so that there's more of a scene as opposed to one-on-one -on -one friendships. Um, and then like subletting to friends, you know, especially if they're visiting from out of town, but sometimes also people will just have housing things come up because it's New York. And so you're kind of just like, make it really easy for them to kind of trial run living with you. Um, so, and I, you know, have some other kind of like tips and stuff like that, but um, but it's more like, yeah, this is a coordination problem and there are these like tangible things you can do to make it easier to coordinate to get your friends to live near you. <laughs> you spoke earlier about um, one of the things you liked about the tech scene when you started entering it was that people were more optimistic. And I imagine you're optimistic about the future. Is that true? I am. Can you tell me about that? <laughs> I tell you about it. Um, I don't know. I think I would have to, to like see the counterfactual or something. Um, yeah, I mean, I just think I think we live in a time like uh, it's funny. So I had a friend who was over earlier today and and he had been going through kind of like this pessimistic time. Um, and also, you know, my friend Daniel, who who runs Maximum New York, he was also downstairs with us too talking. And so basically my friend asked Daniel, he was like, he was almost like, I need to be optimism pilled again kind of thing. And and so Daniel was like, well, what are you thinking? Like, what's what what sort of pessimistic ideas are on your mind? And the first thing he said was like, well, it just seems like there's like so much war. And then Daniel said like, well, like what, what wars, how many wars are there basically? And then he was like, well, there's the Ukrainian war and there's the Israeli war, Israel, Pal Palestine and Ukraine, Russia. And, and then Daniel said, you know, that's only two wars. That's like, that doesn't seem like that many wars actually based on like, like historically. Mm. Um, and, and he was like, okay, like, I guess that's a good point, um, which obviously, you know, none of us like war, but, but, but yes, it can feel like, it can feel like there's more war than ever um, when, objectively I suspect that's not true um, and then I think Daniel helped him with this reframe where he was like you know when I think about those wars I think about how incredible it is that like basically uh, we have like this land war in Europe and like there's no like nuclear escalation basically it's like no one's even thinking about it um, and there was like a time when we thought that was like impossible basically like people were really really worried about that and obviously things can change but basically he was saying you know from the outside what it seems to me is that actually like like statecraft and the state departments of these countries are actually doing a really good job. Um, and so that I think is kind of an interesting reframe. Um, yeah, I just, I think I feel like I, you know, there's a lot of problems in the world um, and I feel equipped to like make an impact on some of the problems local to me. And I'm also like excited because I get to meet people or just like see of people kind of also making an impact on their problems. And I think it's kind of like there will always be problems and there have always been problems. But the optimism comes from the fact that like we can continue making steps forward and it seems like we are. How to put this. Um, I imagined you were an optimist partly because of the way you spoke about it earlier and you're like, oh, I entered this phase and yeah, also what you're talking about with problems that knowing that you can solve problems and sometimes you can solve really big problems even when one day and um, yeah, but I also imagined you're an optimist because you're having a child and I think having a child oh. is a vote of optimism in the future. Like if, if you're really pessimistic, probably wouldn't have children um, by and large and um, I wonder if there's anything that you like pray for, for your daughter, or hope for, for her future? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think for me, having a daughter is very exciting. And a lot of what I think about is how I'm going to raise her um, and how I'm going to school her. And I think, I guess another cause for optimism is like, I suspect that as a generation, at least in America, but maybe across maybe the first world, um, I think we are often like mentally healthier and higher EQ than ever. Um, and I think this is because of the internet and because of YouTube and because of podcasts, basically like it's really easy for us to spread wisdom. It's really easy for, you know, like the jhanas to become viral or something. I've never done the jhanas, but you know what I mean? There's, it's like, it's easier to find 
help with anything. Um, and sometimes I find this when I talk to um, like my, like Andrew's parents or, or my friend's parents, where they, they'll tell me stories about growing up or not growing up. They'll tell me stories about when they were like, you know, my age and when they were raising kids. And like, like Andrew's mom was basically like, you know, I had very little guidance, you know, like I would have questions about like how to handle a tantrum or whatever it was. Right. And it's like, there was no, I couldn't Google it. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, uh, I maybe had some books but like I, I didn't really have to, people to turn to. And so I think that's like a major difference in our generation is like just the fact that I like literally like if I have trouble with, you know, something going on with my, my daughter, I can like tweet about it and be like, hey, anyone know <laughs> like what to do? I think Visa had a tweet recently. I forget what he was asking about or I think he was more sharing advice about like getting his son to sleep and how he used to kind of cradle him like this and that worked when he was really young but then he like got a little bit older and then he like wouldn't sleep like this and so he'd get really fussy and at some point he like stayed up all night and then Visa learned that like you know holding him upright wasn't quite working but I think like holding him like over his shoulder kind of worked or something <laughs> and so it's like all these like tiny amounts of alpha or something that like we can just share across the world <laughs> um and anyway I got a little bit off track but I think like I think I hope that, like, I hope to be a very good parent, um, and I hope to be able to give my daughter, like, a very loving environment. Um, I hope to, like, be able to teach her to kind of, like, be able to pursue her own dreams. Um, and also, I think I have a lot of confidence doing that, and a lot of it is because I do feel like I have, like, this whole world that I can turn to for advice, and I have a really strong, you know, local community around me. Um, so yeah, that's, those are my hopes. Hmm. Hmm. Do you have a sense that you personally or the sort of like network of fractal projects need any help of any specific kind? Oh, great question. Um, we're a really local project. So I think we often get people reaching out who want to help from across the world. And that is hard, I think. But mm -hmm. um, locally to New York, I mean, we need more spaces to teach in because we teach practical university classes out of living rooms um i think we're getting to the point where we where we do want funding and we pursued a little bit of funding and, that, and that's worked but um but yes we we are very open to funding offers especially i think especially like charitable donations so um i think we found the most luck in fundraising in kind of like a more startup -y way where people are like we want to invest in fractal and then we're like well fractal doesn't really make any money it's not like it's not really it's like just seems like a bad investment for you like we probably are never going to make that much money maybe i don't know um but like that's not really the point of the project um so yes money could help space could help um if you live in new york city definitely encourage you to kind of uh take a class at fractal university or just like come visit an event Um, I think something Andrew and I think about is like this idea of mentorship or something and how it f actually feels a little bit harder to find even than we'd expected. So like, I guess I'm, I'm open to offers of mentorship from like, you know, old world community organizers who have, who have done this before. So yeah, those are some of the things that come to mind. You have a sense of what you would want funding for? Yeah, like Fractal University, for example, we held an orientation um, at the beginning of the semester, and we basically had a venue that could only hold 40 students, but we have 200 students. Um, and so in summer semester, we can just hold that orientation out in um, in like a park or something, and maybe we can accommodate everyone. But essentially, like, um, I think a lot of the funding would go, or some of the funding at least, would probably go towards um, more space. And and I think the space can be, I, I don't think that needs to be like just sustainable on donations. I think like the space can be modeled like a co-working space and you could have membership fees and you can, we 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 do charge money for fractal university classes so we can kind of like use the money from those classes. So I think we could make it sustainable, but that's probably part of what we would use funding for. Um, I think another big part is that we have so before we were just following this fractal one model where everybody was just in an apartment um and that it was mostly doable like based on people's kind of basically credit essentially um and based on the prices of those apartments and also that building is just like 
kind of unreal in that like it in terms of the New York City housing market where sometimes the security deposit is as low as like $500 whereas usually a security deposit is one month's rent which is much higher um but as we expand out and I'm hoping people will start co-living houses all over the city um a lot of these like you know you'll you'll have these beautiful kind of like seven bedroom mansions that can sustain you know, a whole brand new community that's really focused on whatever their focus is and often becomes like like a, a place where lots of events are held. And even though there's only, you know, a handful of people who actually live there, there's usually like a bunch of people who kind of benefit from that house. Um, literally signing for some of those houses, like sometimes you have to put down like $40,000 like up front, basically. Um, and so that in itself is a blocker for people. And so we've been kind of coordinating that on an individual basis, but like um, it would be great to be able to kind of insure new co-living houses in a way um, or be able to kind of like front some of the money there. Um, yeah, I think I think space is probably the biggest things we'd invest in. I'm sure there's other things that I'm not thinking of right now, but the, that to me feels like the most salient. I appreciate you answering my questions of a breadth of curiosities. Um, is there anything that you would like to talk about? Uh, no, actually, no. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, as I said at the beginning, I really admire everything you are doing. And um, I love the the different projects that are happening. And I'm glad I'm connected to it. I'm enjoying the course that I'm taking. And um, it also, yeah, it gives me hope. Um, I'm an optimist. I'm not needing to be optimist pill, but I always like hearing new things that make me optimistic. And um, in particular, um, how to put it? Yeah, you're sort of duct taping something new together over the years. That's, I think, what we need and different solutions and attempts and projects at different things. And yeah, fucking around until you find out. And so I'm glad you all are finding out and I appreciate everything you are doing. So thanks for talking with me about it. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I guess I have a question for you. So it's crazy. You have come to Newark, um, but I haven't seen you yet. I'm kind of pregnant and sleeping a lot and just uh, MIA. Um, uh -huh. And yeah, I'm curious, like how you f find it and um, both specifically, like I know you're taking this fractal university class, but also just your experience here. I think you've been nomadic for a long time as well. And so I, I don't know what your history is with New York as well. But um, yeah, how's it going? Mm. Um, yeah. Um, you know, in the past, I thought that I really didn't like New York very much. And, uh, and, and the last time I was, or one of the last times I was here, I was like, oh, it's mostly just Manhattan that I don't like Brooklyn and uh, Queens and the Bronx and all that are, are pretty okay. But uh, I don't really like Manhattan still, but uh, sorry, Manhattan. But um, I think part of it is just being sort of sensory overstimulated pretty easily, not only with like sounds and noises, but being pretty attuned to people's energies and stuff like that. Just like, oh, there's a lot going on. Um, but um, yeah, I think especially the last few months, I was going through a lot of internal changes and growing pretty quickly and um, yeah, kind of almost becoming a different person in some ways and, or more myself is another way to put it. And I experienced a lot of that, like having a lot of energy and expressing myself more and um, being more free form in that. And when I was elsewhere, there was sometimes the sense of like being too much or something of like, oh, wow, that's a lot of energy. And so one thing I've been really appreciating about being in New York is like, people are not bothered if, you know, I'm, you know, being myself there is like a sort of a sense of being a small fish in a big pond as opposed to the other way around and that's that's really nice it's like oh phew, I can just do my thing and people are like yeah this is a Tuesday dude <laughs> and um yeah and I, one of the main intentions is to um work on music production and so having the EDM course by David Schimmel at Fractal has been really helpful he's doing great and uh I'm already I'm, I'm kind of amazed at how much I've learned so quickly and um yeah it's cool to be i've been planning this for a while to like have a music production arc and kind of put some pieces in place for that to be possible and um so it's nice to be starting on that and yeah there's so many lovely people you all are connected to and that are in new york and so i'm really enjoying the sort of social scene and seeing a lot of people and talking to people and uh telling people about what i'm working on and hearing about what other people are working on that's really 
that's really nourishing. I think sometimes when I'm elsewhere, I feel a little lonely. Um, it depends where I am, but like, yeah, if I'm in like a rural place, it's nice because I love nature and I love going for long walks and things like that. But then it can be kind of lonely because I don't necessarily have my peers are all online at that point. And so it's nice to be like, yeah, they're, you know, I can talk with you for two hours about what you're doing with Fractal and be like, oh, man, I'm glad you all are doing that. And oh, I had thought of that that way. And um, that's inspiring for this different thing. And um, so, yeah, it's inspiring and encouraging. And yeah, I love I love hearing what people are up to. So. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, a couple of things come to mind. Number one is so Andrew's, as you know, is, is taking that EDM class too. And that's that's been his feedback too, is he's like, he basically is like, oh, we make a song like every class essentially. Uh -huh. And he's like, I just didn't think we would be starting on that until much later or something. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think he has a sense that he's learning very quickly, much quicker than he thought. Um, yeah, I think it, it made me think, like you were saying, is there anything else I want to talk about? Um, and two things you said in there. Uh, make me want to say something which is um yeah I think from the outside people think of New York as Manhattan and I guess maybe if you're watching this podcast you might not realize like Fractal is entirely based in Brooklyn both of our Fractals Fractal 1 and Fractal 2 um I do not go to Manhattan very often and um you know I think Manhattan has its own magic but um but New York is not just Manhattan and um I think particularly I think Brooklyn is a very special place and I think the last part, um, this idea of like you're you're never too much, you know, it's like it's like a Tuesday and you can be however you want, you can dress how you want. I think that is a big part of the magic that also keeps me in New York. And there's this like very famous Paul Graham essay where he talks about cities and ambition, like what does each city tell you? And he claims that New York tells you you should make more money. Yeah. And I think it's more fair to say Manhattan tells you you should make more money. Um, and I think that Brooklyn tells you you should be more free. Mm. And basically you can just do whatever you want here. You can be whatever you want here. You can like act weird. You can talk to yourself on the street. Like it just doesn't matter. Um, people like are just very accepting essentially um, because there's just such a high density of strange, interesting people here that it's kind of just like, oh, you're just like another person being strange and interesting. And um, yeah, so there's a lot of freedom, I think, in how you express yourself. What does that look like for you to feel more... Yeah, like empowered to be free or to be more yourself. Partly, um, I think I dress in more fun ways here. I think that's like one. And, you know, New York is is kind of in some ways like, OK, it's like people are into fashion, but I think that's that's not quite the right frame. It's like you can just you can wear you can be loud. You can wear you can wear anything you want, really. Um, you can literally be like totally dressed up as like a clown or something nowhere near Halloween. And it just doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Um Yeah, what else does it look like? I don't know. It it feels really good. I know how it feels, but I'm not totally sure how what it looks like. Um, I think it's part of like, I don't exactly know how to say, it, but it's like New York feels very diverse, and I think the diversity, like partly, it's that there's there's literally a diversity of people from all over the world here. Um, but also, I think some of the diversity comes from like, there is no one way that you're like supposed to be in New York. And so there's like all these people kind of expressing themselves in their own ways and dressing in their own ways and stuff. Um, and so I just enjoy that. I enjoy having so many different types of people and um, not having like expectations to be a certain way. Mm. I've really, really enjoyed that. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's felt, uh, yeah, like a good time. I mean, in some ways, I how to put it. Yeah, I'm on this pilgrimage and I travel from place to place. And um, for me, part of a pilgrimage is is trusting or surrendering where you need to go. And um, like, I've talked with my friend Anansi a fair bit about this. And it's a little bit like the life energy wants you to go somewhere. And I really yeah. feel that like almost, yeah. I, I, in fact, I remember seeing Andrew's tweet about the spring semester and I was like, hold, I, you can see this on Twitter. This is public. I was like, hold up. You are doing an EDM music production course this semester. Like, oh, wow. I was like, it was sort of, um, I had, New York was like not on my agenda. I was not planning to go to New York, but it was like, oh, okay, I guess I'm going to New York and I need to like rearrange everything to uh, go there. And it felt, it's really felt like the I don't know, from my perspective, like the life force, God, whatever the universe wants me to be here and uh, feels like the right time for a New York chapter. So I love that. Yeah. Hmm. Well, thanks so much for joining me, friend. It's been great to talk about this. And I've been 
as I say, inspired, and I look forward to seeing how the project evolves over the years. All right. Yeah, thanks for having me on. This was really fun. Mm.